want to read the whole story, verse 12 to 16. Follow with me in Luke chapter 5. Luke says, it came to pass that when he, that is Jesus, was in a certain city, behold, or look, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him or begged him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And so he put forth his hand and he touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. So beautiful. And so he charged the man, saying, Tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing according to the Mos what Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But so much the more, verse 15, went abroad the fame of him. The great multitudes came together to hear him and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And so Jesus withdrew himself, verse 16, into the wilderness and prayed. The title of my sermon this morning is Jesus Can Make You Clean. And I've taken that title from verse 12 of the story where it says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now, how does Jesus make the vile, filthy clean? The answer is in verse 20, he forgives our sins. So there's a story of a leper being cleansed, and then the next section is a lame man being healed and able to walk. So he forgives our sins and cleanses us, and then he restores us and allows us and enables us to walk in his way that pleases him. So he forgives our sins. Now it pictures Christ's miracle of the cleansing of the leper. So pictured in this miracle of the cleansing of the leper is how God forgives us and cleanses us from our sins. The miracle is recorded also in Mark 1 and in Matthew chapter 8. So all three of the synoptics, Mark 1, Matthew 8, and Luke chapter 5, all three of them give the record of Jesus cleansing this leprous man. The Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be confirmed. Whenever there's multiple recording of a single miracle, it's an evident sign that God wants us to get the message that's portrayed or pictured in that miracle. Now, the story paints a picture of how Jesus is willing and able to cleanse us from sin and to restore us and to make us whole. So there's a lot of lessons I can't draw in one sermon from, from this text. That's what's kind of frustrating for me, not to be able to spend two or three weeks in one passage and draw all out of there. But the picture of Jesus is so beautiful. He's compassionate. He's sympathetic. He's kind. He's willing. He's able to cleanse us from our sin. That's good news. Amen? Because the Bible says all of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous, no, not one. So we are all this leprous man, and we all need Christ to cleanse us and to forgive us and to restore us. Leprosy in the scriptures is a picture of the uncleanness of sin. God alone has the power to cleanse us from sin. Now, there are four movements in the story I want to take one at a time. If you're taking notes, they'll be listed on the screen. But I want you to see them in the text. The first is the dreaded disease itself. Look at verse 12, the first half. It says, It came to pass that when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy. Now, this is the setting. Notice he uses the phrase, it came to pass. So it's an indefinite time period. We don't know how long after the other episode was. Then he says he was in a certain city. What city? We don't know. Certain city. Now, it's believed by most Bible scholars that it was maybe Capernaum where Peter lived. He was there with Peter, James, and John, Andrew in the boat. Remember the fishers of men. Or it could be in the area of Gennesaret, that plain on the western side of the Sea of Galilee, one of the little villages or the towns. But again, we don't know the city of the place where the man was. Now, the setting in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 1, take note, chapter 8, verse 1, it says that Jesus encountered this leprous man 
when he was coming down from the mountain. In the context there of Matthew 8, 1, what is the mountain? It's the Mount of Beatitudes. In Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7, up to chapter 8, Jesus is on the Mount of Beatitudes, and he's teaching the disciples. Now, in Bible days, it wasn't called the Mount of Beatitudes, but now that Jesus taught there the Beatitudes, that's why we call it the Mount of Beatitudes. So this beautiful mountain, one of my favorite places to go in Israel when we travel there, is the Mount of Beatitudes. My favorite thing to do is to teach through the entire Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7. We cover all those chapters as we look at the view where Jesus would have been front standing when he taught the, the, or sat and taught the beautiful Sermon on the Mount. So he just finished the Sermon on the Mount. He came down the mountain and he encounters this leprous man. Now I want you to notice his sickness is described in verse 12. Behold or look a man. And Dr. Luke only adds this little bit full of leprosy. Others, gospels say a leper. Dr. Luke being more specific said he was full of leprosy. It means that he had all his body was actually affected by this terrible disease. Now, leprosy in Bible days was the most dreaded disease in the ancient world. No one feared anything more than leprosy. Maybe death, be second only to death. And the leper person was very, very, very sad existence. It was the most dreaded disease because you had to be ostracized from all others. You can read about it in Leviticus chapter 13 and 14. By the way, that's a great background for you to read about leprosy in the Bible. Leviticus 13 and chapter 14. So that's the background in Leviticus. The leprous person was an outcast. He was barred from family, friends, the temple, synagogue, the city. He was outside of all society. Actually, today, this disease is known as Hansen's disease. And by the way, today they have antibiotics that can treat it. There are still, in, there are still people that have leprosy or Hansen's disease, it's called today. It's not as prevalent as it was years past, but it's treatable and it can be eliminated with antibiotics. But in the Bible days, there was no antibiotics, there was no treatment, it was a dreaded disease, and you were ostracized from your family, friends, temple, synagogue, and the city. So I, I don't know the circumstances of this man. If he were married, he's been separated from his family. If he has children, he can't hug them, kiss them, tuck them in bed at night, he's ostracized. So rabbis taught that if you have leprosy, you must stand at least six feet away from other people. And they actually put dots in the sand <laughs> six feet apart. Wait, no, no, no that's, that's something else I was thinking about. <laughs> Sorry about that. And the poor leper would have to cover his mouth. And everywhere you went, why are you laughing? You would have to cry, unclean, unclean, unclean. Can you imagine what that did to your social life? You're going to a birthday party, unclean, unclean. Everybody empties, and at least you get to eat all the cake for yourself. So it was a very, very loathsome, dreaded Disease. People would lose their limbs, they would lose fingers, they would lose their ears. You've seen the pictures in Bible dictionaries of people, no nose, no ears, all your hair is off your face, your skin is all affected. They would lose limbs and they would get numb and hurt themselves and then they would get infected and lose hands or feet or legs. It was kind of a living death. They actually described, Josephus, the ancient historian, described it as a living death. Now, it is in the Bible, as I said, a picture of sin. You can't really understand this story if you don't understand the doctrine of sin. The Bible tells us that sin is the result of Adam and Eve's fall in the Garden of Eden. You have a real Adam, a real Eve. They disobeyed God. They brought sin and death into the world. And sin brought death into the world. 
So, or we, we see that it's a picture of sin and we need a savior. Now notice we move from the dreaded disease to the desperate victim in verse 12, the end of the verse. This man full of leprosy who's seeing Jesus. What a blessed thing when we see Jesus. Fell on his face and besought him, that is Christ, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now this man came to Jesus needing a healing and Jesus would touch him, would speak to him, and would heal him. But I want you to notice five facts about how this man came. And this is the, really the heart of this story. Number one, if you're taking notes, he came out of an awareness of need. He was full of leprosy. He was aware of his need. And only Dr. Luke mentions that fact that he was fully covered with leprosy. You know, when we come to Jesus, we must come out of a born sense of need of a Savior. We must come to him with a sense of, I am a sinner, I need a Savior. And it is a grace of God when he allows you to see your sinfulness, your wretchedness, your uncleanness, and that you are unrighteous, and that you must come to God with your sin for salvation. So he was coming out of a sense of need. We must come poor, wretched, naked, and blind. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount that he just delivered in context, said, blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are they that mourn. You want to be blessed? You need to see yourself as spiritually bankrupt before a holy God. And you need to see your need of a Savior. We need to accept that we are unacceptable before a holy, righteous God. You know, the Bible says that our righteousness, our best, is like filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. So no one comes to Christ with real repentance and salvation unless God grants them the ability to see their sinful hearts. It's a sign of God's mercy when he allows you to see, I'm a sinner, I need a savior. Secondly, this man came to Jesus with reverence. Notice verse 12, who seeing Jesus fell on his face. Now that word fell on his face, word fall, literally means that he fell down to worship him. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 2, Matthew actually uses that statement. He worshiped him. So the man falling down, the word fall down there means to kiss. Because when you laid prostrate on the ground, it looked like you were kissing the ground. So it's a, a word that in the Hebrew was used for worship. He bowed down. So he came out of a sense of need and awareness of need. I'm a sinner. And he came with reverence that he fell on his face and he worshiped him. He knew he was God in flesh. And then thirdly, he came in humble submission. I love it. Look at verse 12 again. It says, he begged Jesus saying, Lord, if thou wilt, you can make me clean. And in the Greek, this is in a present tense. He kept saying, kept saying, kept saying, Lord, if you will, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. So he's laying on his face, prostrate before the Lord. And he's actually saying, if you will. Now, he wasn't questioning Christ's ability. He was just questioning his willingness. Are you willing to heal me? I don't know. I know you can but I'm not sure what your will might be. So he came humbly, submitted to Christ as his only source of healing. Now I want to say right now, before I go any further, God is always willing to forgive you. Not only able, he's able, right? He is willing. Whoever comes to me, Jesus said, I will in no wise cast out. We learn from the story, there's no one too sinful to come to God. So if you realize your sin today and you're under conviction, come to Christ. Come humbly submitting to him. Notice, fourthly, he came in confident faith when he said, verse 12, you can make me clean. I love that. I don't know if you're willing, but I know you're able. You can make me clean. The Bible says, he that comes to God 
must first believe that he is and that he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we come to God by faith. The Bible says, by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not of yourself. That is, salvation is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we come believing, we come trusting by faith. He had perhaps seen Jesus heal. He perhaps heard from others what Jesus had done for them. And he thought, perhaps maybe he can forgive me. Maybe he can heal me. Maybe he can touch my body and make me clean. And then number five, he came to Jesus as he was unclean. This is just inferred in the text. He didn't try to clean up his life and then come to Jesus. You know, a lot of people feel like I'm too sinful to come to Jesus. Let me make it clear. No one is too sinful to come to Christ. He knows everything about your sin. He loves you and he will forgive you if you will turn. By the way, that's what the word repent means. It means to change your mind. And that change of mind, metanoia, means to change of direction. So you see yourself a sinner, you change your mind about following your sin, you turn around, you follow Jesus. And he saw Jesus, came to Jesus, but I believe that Jesus was coming to him as well. Everyone else was running away from the man, Jesus was going to the man. He's always attracted to the person with the greatest need. If you're here today and you're saying, I'm the chief of all sinners, And Jesus is thinking about you. He wants to forgive you. No one too sinful, no one too good not to come. We all have sinned. We must come to Jesus for salvation. Now we move from the dreaded disease, the desperate victim, and this is my favorite, verse 13, to the divine compassion. The divine compassion, verse 13. says that he put forth his hand. Now this is describing Christ's response to this man with the dreaded disease of leprosy. He put forth his hand, I love that, and did what? Touched him. It's a wonderful day when Jesus touches you, amen? When he reaches out and touches you, saying, I will be thou clean. And notice it says immediately, not progressively, Not over days, weeks, months, but immediately the leprosy departed from him. I love this. Number one, Jesus touched the man. Jesus could have healed him with a word from a distance. Now, I would think if it was me, I would say, stay right there. Don't come any closer. Stand on your little dot. You know that if the wind was blowing away from the leper toward you, you had to, you had to separate 100 feet. I would have said, be healed, get away, see you later, alligator. Be gone. You know, Jesus can speak a word and heal, right? He didn't have to touch him. Highly against the law at that time to touch a leprous person. If you touched the leper, you were unclean. If you touched the leper, you couldn't go to temple. You couldn't go to synagogue. You couldn't couldn't go back home that day. But Jesus touches the untouchable. Jesus touches those that people run away from. He touched you. He touched me. He reaches out to those who the world despises. So Jesus touched him. Why did Jesus touch him? Well, I think Jesus wanted to lovingly, graciously, compassionately touch him so that he would know his sympathy and his compassion. He would be feeling it. He would be felt the touch. So he expressed more than just a touch. The word touched, I looked it up in the Greek, actually means to take hold of. It's actually translated in other places to take hold of. So Jesus didn't go, be healed. Jesus held on to him. Jesus probably embraced him. And everyone's watching. He's, he, 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 he's going to touch a leper. I thought he was going to touch a leper. 
Because the minute he touched him, he was no longer a leper, right? They're like, oh, no, oh, no, he's going to touch, he's going to touch a leper. He touched a leper. No, no, he didn't touch a leper. Because the man was immediately healed. But I believe Jesus actually put his arms around him. Maybe this is the first time in years he felt a human touch. Heard of a man who was so lonely he would go every week to have his hair cut just to feel someone touching him, someone to talk to. So this man would be touched by Jesus. The touch expressed more than a superficial touch. Jesus wanted him to feel his sympathy and compassion. And it's the reason for the incarnation. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 18, it says, No one has ever seen God, but the only begotten Son of God. In the Greek, it's very powerful, by the way. It's the only begotten God who's in the bosom of the Father hath declared him. The word is exegete or explained him. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then verse 18 of John 1, he came to explain God to us. Who is God? Compassionate, sympathetic, loving, and kind. And he takes hold of us. What a blessing. And so God became a man so that in all points he could be tempted like we are, yet without sin. So this conveys the incarnation, his hand touching the man. I understand. I love you. I will cleanse you. I will be thou cleansed. A marvelous truth. Jesus then spoke after he touched him. I will be thou clean. The word of assurance. You know, when you trust Jesus as your Savior to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, what is your response? Believe God's word. Amen? You know, it's as simple as that. You know, John 3.16, the verse we're so familiar with, the whole Bible in one verse, it's a verse of assurance. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, and that word whosoever means whosoever. Isn't that profound? Believes in him shall not, what? Perish. Shall not perish, but have present possession, everlasting life. Do you believe that? Rest in that. What do you have to go on? God's word. Not your feelings, not your emotions, not your experience. The Bible, the word of God. So Jesus physically touched him, took hold of him. Then Jesus talked to him, spoke to him. He had God's word. We have God's word. We must rest in his promises. And then thirdly, Jesus immediately cleansed him. Verse 13, immediately the leprosy departed from him. Now, it was forbidden, as I said, to touch a leper. But the minute Jesus touched him, he was no longer a leper. And instead of Jesus contracting his leprosy and his disease, Jesus imparted to him his righteousness. You know, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he paid for our sins on the cross so that he could communicate and communicate to us his righteousness, impart or impute, the word is, to us his righteousness. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says there, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, cleanses us from all of our sins sins. What a blessed thing it is that when we trust in Christ, when we call out to the Lord, he cleanses us and washes us and forgives us. You know, you should never outgrow the wonder of God's amazing grace in saving you, a guilty, lost sinner, unclean. 
that God would grant you the ability to see your need, that you would come to Him for forgiveness, that He would open your heart and your eyes to Him, and then you trusted Him, He saved you by His grace, and you've been washed, and you've been forgiven. Now, the last point I want to make in verse 14 to verse 16 is the definite command. This is an interesting part of the story. Jesus charged in verse 14, saying, tell no man. Now, the other gospels indicate he did. Jesus said, Shh, don't tell anybody about this. Now, how do you do that, right? You're a leper. You've been ostracized from all society. You want to go back to your family? Shh, don't tell anybody. You know, it's funny. We get forgiven of our sins. We become Christians. And the Bible says that we should go into all the world and preach the gospel. We should tell others. And we don't say anything. This man was told not to say anything. And he blabbed it to everyone. May God help us. So Jesus gives him this command, this instruction that many people have a hard time understanding. Jesus said, Go show thyself, verse 14, to the priest. Now, this is where a Leviticus 14 comes into play. In Leviticus 14, it gives the instructions for the priest as to when a leper would be cleansed, which, by the way, would only happen when Messiah came. This is the steps they should take for that cleansing. So show thyself to the priest, which most likely meant that he would have to leave Galilee and travel a couple of days down to Jerusalem for that to happen. And offer, verse 14, thy cleansing according as Moses, in Leviticus 14, had commanded for a testimony unto them. But so much more went out the fame of him abroad, that great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmity. Now, part of that fame abroad, multitudes coming, was because the man was blabbing it to everybody, telling everybody what Christ had done for him. And so Jesus then did not respond to the crowds, but withdrew, verse 16, himself into the wilderness and prayed. So here again, Jesus is being overrun with crowds that want to be healed, and he goes again to a quiet place to be alone and pray and talk to his father. Now, why did Jesus give this man this odd command, tell no one, but go to the priest and show thyself and give sacrifice for your cleansing. Number one, for a practical reason, Leviticus 14 would be a witness to the priest. And that's what he says in verse 14, for a testimony unto many unto them. So the priest would have Leviticus 14 before them in scripture, but they would say, hey, we've never had to use this. No lepers have ever been cleansed. But all of a sudden, why is it all these lepers start showing up and this guy named Jesus is, for, is cleansing them and maybe perhaps it would begin to compute, maybe Messiah is now come. And then prophetic reasons, Messiah was predicted that he would heal, that he would forgive, that he would restore, that he would cleanse from leprosy. When John the Baptist was put in prison, I love this story. I preach a sermon on this text and I call it Doubting Castle. John the Baptist, who looked at Jesus and said, look, behold, the Lamb of God who will carry away the sin of the world. John the Baptist, who baptized Jesus in the Jordan and saw the heavens open, a dove came down in the form of, Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove, and the audible voice of the Father said, this is my Son in whom I sold delights, is now in prison and doubting. And so he sends one of his followers to Jesus and asks Jesus, are you the Messiah or should we look for someone else? Now, I, I, it just really blows my mind that someone like John the Baptist would doubt. But if you get thrown in prison, you could struggle with your doubts as well. Why was he doubting? Because he believed the Messiah would come to deliver him. Why am I not being delivered? Why am I not being rescued? And so they came to Jesus. They asked their question. Jesus said, you go back and tell John that the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the dead have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who is not offended or scandaled by me. 
And they went back and told John. So John then rested in that word that he is the Messiah because of the miracles that he was performing. So John was aware of that earlier, but now he's assured that this is a messianic miracle that the Messiah has arrived. And then for what I call pictorial reasons, Leviticus chapter 14. You know that Leviticus 14, when you get a chance to read it, it pictures the cross. A leopard that was cleansed was to bring two birds. He was to bring a piece of hyssop wood, a little stick of hyssop wood, and some scarlet colored thread and a bowl. And he would come to the priest, the priest would take one of the birds and kill it, and it would bleed into the bowl. Then they would take the living bird, and this is an abbreviated version of the description of Leviticus 14. Then they would tie the living bird to the hyssop stick with the scarlet thread. They would dip the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed and put in the bowl. Then they would take the bird out, they would unloose it, and let it fly away. And as it flew away, fluttered away, the blood would sprinkle off its wings. Then the priest would take the stick of hyssop covered with blood, and he would sprinkle it on the leprous man seven times, and he would be declared cleansed. And he could go back to his wife and his family and kids, and he could go back to synagogue and back to his life. But it's a picture of Christ's death on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. The living bird coming out of the blood, a picture of Christ risen from the dead. So this is a pictorial reason for this story in the Bible. So it's a literal, actual story about a man who was leprous and was healed. I believe in the historicity of this story and that it's a miracle. But it was also pictorial and it conveyed the picture of the cross of Christ who dies on the cross to forgive us and to cleanse us from our sins. Jesus also was giving in this story a pattern of having compassion on people that most of the world despises. You know, uh, sometimes I'll see somebody that looks pretty messed up. And I'll say, man, that guy's messed up. My wife said, yeah, that's what you looked like before you got saved. She always lets me know that. Look how messed up that dude is. Yeah, that's what you look like. Whoa. I knew that I was blind, and now I see. I knew that I was unclean, and now I'm clean. But many times we get so comfortable in our little Christian bubble. Cooties, I don't, I don't want to touch them. They're unclean. Jesus touched the untouchable. So should we. His compassion, his sympathy, and his mercy should be seen in us. Amen? Amen? That we would be like Christ in his sympathy and compassion, reaching out to those who are in need. Now, by way of wrapping this up, number one, we come to Jesus, how? With a deep awareness of our sin and a sense of our unworthiness. Naked, poor, wretched, and blind. We come to him for forgiveness, for cleansing, for clothes, and restoration. We come with reverence and humility. You come with brokenness. You come with reverence. You come with respect. You believe that he is, and he rewards those who seek him. And then secondly or thirdly, you come just as you are. If you're here today and you feel like I'm not worthy to be coming to God. Maybe you don't even feel worthy to come to church. I've invited people to church to go, if I come to church, the roof would fall in on me. I don't think so. I love it when Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You'll find rest for your souls. You know, you can go to the drugstore and buy sleep, right? But you can't find rest for your souls. Only Jesus can give you rest in your soul. So you come to him just as you are, weary, worn, and sad. You come to him how? In faith, believing, 
The man says, you can't make me clean, knowing that Jesus is willing and able to forgive you and to cleanse you. No sin too great, but well, God's grace is greater still. No disease so heinous, but what God's love will forgive and cleanse. Someone put it in a poem, I came to Jesus as I was, weary, worn, and sad. And I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. Amen? Let's pray.